Welcome to Hired the Podcast. Thanks for being here today. I am here with Megan Ziemba, owner of Z Inc. Solutions, Chief Marketing Officer for 38th Street Studios and host of Maidens of Manufacturing, uh, a wonderful, wonderful broadcast, uh, really celebrating and advocating for the wonderful and amazing women changing the world of manufacturing. Megan, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, Travis. My pleasure. Um, so Megan, let's let's start there. The world of work is changing, manufacturing especially. Mm -hmm. What can companies do to do everything in their power to make sure that they're hiring the best and brightest minds in the world, which has traditionally companies have had a challenge bringing on and hiring those tremendous women in mm -hmm. manufacturing. What can they do to make sure that they are finding the best and not discriminating and continuing to hire old white guys like me? Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm one that wants to put this out there, too. Like, we still need the old white guys in the sector, so I'm not trying to push all of the men out of the sector. We need everybody involved in this great place because without manufacturing, we're basically losing the lifeline of our great country. So I'm not trying to push any specific community out, just bringing more people in. And traditionally, women weren't um, exposed to opportunities within engineering and manufacturing. I remember my own journey where I tested very well in English um, programs or English classes. So I was destined to be some sort of college professor or teacher, which is not something that really interested me. Interested me. So um, I think we need to start younger in terms of exposing kids to what engineering and manufacturing are, and then figure out creative ways how to keep that exposure going as they're going through school. Because by the time they get into high school, they have some idea what they want to do, and it can be a little late at that point if we don't start exposing them at younger ages. The other thing I, I think we need to do is get rid of the misconception that engineering and manufacturing isn't creative. Women tend to be more creative than men. And we work really well in team environments and we like to collaborate with more people where men tend to be more competitive and they excel better when they're um, working on their own. So what can we do to bring in some team learning in some of these courses and programs where they're not just, you know, doing the projects, but they're actually working on some of those soft skills as well, too, and communicating. I think what manufacturers also need to do is they need to be more proactive in getting in front of the next generation. Right now, there's a lot of conversations happening, especially on LinkedIn, and they're not really talking to the next generation. Um, there are some really good advocates that do that for them, but manufacturers like Haas, mm -hmm. who makes really good CNC machines, um, a lot of kids know them because they have done the work and they're putting their machines in the high school level so when kids are learning about cnc machining that's the brand that they see so if you don't have mentor programs or um leadership programs maybe consider joining something like first and be a mentor that way so that you're either donating or sponsoring a team and giving them components that they need to make the robots and then volunteer your time because then that way they're going to learn who you are as an individual but then also learn about the company you're working for well you were just telling me about a school that's having a really big challenge right now because yeah they you tell the story i, I butcher it Tell so it. i just talked to a gentleman from uh, virginia he is a teacher at a community college he actually quit corporate to go teach the next generation because he saw that there's a need to connect the education at that level with what we're actually doing in the field and one of his students accidentally pinched a cable and they're working with fanic cobots well they have to go through a process to get funding to buy a new cable Normally, you can get that part within three to five business days. It's going to take until the end of the semester if he goes through the traditional channels of getting the funding for it to get that cable back. So now he only has two cobots that are working and not the third. So I just said, why not reach out to Fanic and see if they can send you a new cable? And um, I think he's going to make a post about it on LinkedIn. So that might be shared sooner then later uh, on my network because I'm trying to help him out. <laughs> well, Noah, let's make sure that that's one of the first clips that goes out. And if anybody at Fanic is listening to this, reach out to Megan. She'll she'll hook you up and 
we can help a bunch of kids. Yes, please. Continue because to learn. Now he, I think he said he had a, a classroom of twelve, so he was splitting it where there was four students on each robot. Now he has to split it even further. So it kind of takes away that attention from four of the kids and it's gonna slow up the learning process because they're down a whole robot. So if we can get that figured out for them, Mm -hmm. it will help this class. (laughs) Yeah, well you were talking about uh, what can companies do to reach out to the the next generation. Mm -hmm. I'm almost wondering if reaching out to that next generation is too late at this point, trying to get kids in high school already interested uh, we were talking earlier about, um, I forget her name, and I apologize. I'm going to attribute her, her in this, um, but she created uh, Goldie Blocks. And I bought it for my daughter for Christmas, and it's just so cool. It's, it's a way to get really, really young women, young girls mm-hmm. interested in engineering through storytelling and creativity and building. And... I think if companies really, really want to lead the charge, it's how do you get the kids interested? And it's it's tough because there's no immediate return on investment for something like that. It's setting companies and organizations in the state of manufacturing up for success mm-hmm. 20, 30 years from now. Which we need, though, because right now we don't have a workforce. Well, we have, but it's deteriorating. And what, what are they saying? Like 2.1 million jobs are going to be available over the next five to 10 years, and we don't have the manpower to fill those positions. Mm-hmm. And if we get more women involved, um, Andrew Crow just shared a stat from Deloitte where if we can get more women involved, we would be able to fill like 50% or 60% of those jobs if more women got Involved. I didn't read the study, so don't quote me on that. I have to double check those numbers. But um, even still, like that's half the workforce you're ignoring. So if we can just start getting more of them involved at younger ages, I think that Goldie Blocks is a really great idea to start doing that. We need to have more STEM books. So I was just at Mission Design um, in Michigan, and we took a facility tour. Uh, We met with uh, one of the leadership members there and they had three children's books on the table. And I was like, can I please take these home with me? Because I have two little boys Mm -hmm. and my boys are obsessed with those books. And they're all about robots. Um, One had like a hundred plus one engineering term. So I'm reading these books to my kids. So that's exposure, right? And one of my kids is obsessed with breaking things and trying to put it back together. So as long as you're paying Paying attention to what kids are focused on and, you know, accommodating that, I think that's a great start because we have to start thinking long term. Short term, yes, that's still a challenge. So what are some of the ways that manufacturers can support their current employees, not just men, but women as well? How can they invest in their employees in terms of upskilling them and getting some them some really great leadership skills, especially if they want to be a leader? Mm-hmm. And then what can they do for some of the older generations? How can they set them up maybe in some of these mentorship program ideas that are floating around? How can they get the older generations to connect to the younger generations? Because they have all that knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't want to lose that when they go out the door. So it's definitely a whole picture item that we need to consider. It's not going to get solved just focusing on one generation over the next. We have to think of the whole picture and long-term goals. Create a system where celebrating manufacturing and the creativity, whereas it almost becomes another art form. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. getting them interested early, getting them interested in young and creating the same mystery and excitement that's associated with sports and with arts. Yeah. I know there's a a school, and I have to find this article, I I think it was either in Indiana or Ohio, but um, what they were doing is they were bringing like small um, machines and color coding the buttons, because what kids don't like buttons, and that's how they were teaching them like the basics of CNC machining. So they were color coding Hmm. the buttons and then attaching the colors with the buttons. So just getting then to think of, oh, push the purple button, push the blue button, and then tying that in as they get older with the more detailed information that's involved with CNC machining. I think that's a great way to do it, too. And Goldie Blocks, I mean, the reason why she came up that, I saw that TED Talk. It was a fantastic one. Um, She noticed that most of the girls that wanted to play, they wanted to read a book. 
So they didn't want to play with the blocks like boys normally do. They wanted to sit down and read a book. So that's why she combined the book with building blocks because then it combined both of the best worlds and it made the girls want to sit there and pay attention, which is interesting. So just what other creative ways can we come up with to Mm -hmm. get kids really excited about it? What was your journey? How did you end up being a kid who's really good at English to being one of the voices for advocacy and manufacturing? Yeah, so that is an interesting story. Um, Again, as I said before, I wasn't encouraged to pursue anything STEM-like. I always tested well in English, so um, I wanted to graduate high school early because I hated high school, and my counselor's like, no, you have to sign up for AP college classes, and I'm like, I don't want to sign up for it. Like, that's, I have no interest in it, but then my mom was, she, my mom thought success meant you had to have a multiple degree so Mm -hmm. she always wanted me to get my doctorate in something and I was just like I'm I don't want to go to school I want to travel the world and learn that way and um peer pressure kicked in and I eventually signed up for school and went to the uh University of Twin Cities with my sister and got on academic probation twice because I was more interested in rebelling against my parents than anything (laughs) and uh at 19 I found out that I was pregnant with my daughter and I was like well now I really need to get my life together so I moved back to Wisconsin went to uh, the University of Milwaukee, and that's where I found out about professional and technical writing. And my main reason why I took that tract is because you get paid more if you write about technology than if you try to become a crappy creative writer, which I (laughs) didn't think I had the skill set to be really creative. So um, had really great teachers. Um, One of our first projects was to create an instruction manual for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich harder than you would think it would be and it was hilarious because he actually went through all of the lists and um i don't think we had one successful peanut butter and jelly sandwich but i still at that point wasn't aware of how amazing engineering and manufacturing was like i've worked um in a couple manufacturing environments one was a distribution center and then another was a cutting tools company Mm -hmm. um And I fell in love with the people immediately at those places. But I really was exposed to like the vast opportunities when I worked for a trade publication after I graduated with my bachelor's and um, I was hooked. I didn't want to leave. I tried leaving, went into higher education, got completely bored out of my mind and then uh, worked in a couple marketing departments for different manufacturing and um, being able to get the brand voice for those companies and have people really connect with their why of why they were making the products that they were making was just really satisfactory for me because um, a lot of engineers that I met, um, they were really socially awkward to put it nicely. Like they didn't like really talking to people. So having to work with those difficult personalities and getting them to smile about what they did, um, I loved it. Because everybody's like, no, you're never going to get that person to talk. They're so mean. And I would always get the meanest person in the room to open up to me and smile and laugh and joke. And I just thought it was really cool that if you just took the time to learn everybody's story, a lot of great things come up for, Mm -hmm. you know, what we are using today. Like every product that we use has a great story behind it and a great why behind it. So um, I take really great pride in my ability to get stories out of people and sharing them and then I just have a unique capability of connecting people so I remember things and I it might seem that I forget them down the line but then eventually something pops up and I'm like oh I know this person that you can connect to and it just helps word of mouth so I'm so jealous of people with that memory it just like it's crazy so yeah i uh when the pandemic hit i was working for a photochemical etching company um remotely because we couldn't go anywhere and i was juggling just sorry juggling um this idea of mavens for a while i actually pitched it to a nonprofit organization who focused on women getting into engineering and manufacturing they turned it down because they said it was too discriminatory and i'm like Okay, so I just like kept it in my back pocket. And then uh, when things started opening up again, um, I went out for whiskey and tacos with one of my mentors and we were sitting there and we were talking about some of our biggest fears. And I have a huge fear of heights, like Hmm. I can't handle them. 
So I decided to go skydiving to overcome that. And it was the greatest experience of my life. And he is like, okay, so why did you do that? And I'm like, I wanted to overcome my fear. And he goes, okay, so why not overcome your fear with starting this podcast? Hmm. He's like, just jump. And I'm like, well, I'm not prepared. Like, I don't know how to do YouTube or any of that stuff. So he's like, make an announcement, see who's interested, and then, you know, go forward from that. So I made an announcement on LinkedIn and I booked shows all the way to August of that year. And I was just completely blown away how many women wanted to share their stories. And um, they saw the need just like I did. So that reconfirmed what I was thinking. And then uh, after that, I went back to him. and I'm like, okay, you need to help me because I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) And my first show was good content, but like all the video and stuff was terrible um, because it was my first show. And he said something to me that has stuck with me till this day. Um, just focus on being 1% better every day. Hmm. And then if you're 1% better than you were yesterday, you're still progressing and moving forward. So I don't like try to improve in big increments. I just focus on that 1% and I keep improving every day instead of taking a step back. So yeah, it's, I love it's, it. it's so important to remember that anything you do, you will be terrible at the first time, oh, yeah. even skydiving. <laughs> I've, been sk- I've been skydiving myself. And w- when I went, you know, you got to go through the instruction. You're doing a tandem jump. They say, OK, you've got the altimeter on your wrist. When you get to, I forget how many thousand feet, pull the ripcord. If you don't pull the ripcord, then we're going to take your hand and we're going to put it on the altimeter, letting you know that you need to look at it and you need to pull the ripcord. If you don't do it then, we're going to take it one more time, put it on there, and if you don't look at it and pull the ripcord then, we're going to pull it for you. And I'm sitting in class, and I'm thinking, who the hell isn't going to do that? I mean, it's right there. You don't want to die. You're going to pay attention, and you're going to pull the ripcord so you don't die. They pulled the ripcord for me. I was terrible at skydiving the first time, was, and I survived. It was so, See, and I didn't do that experience. I had someone. I was strapped to someone, so I didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. They did it. They pulled the rip cord. I just enjoyed the fall. Mm-hmm. And um, I want to go back and I want to learn how to do it on my own because I have uh, I do CrossFit and the CrossFit gym that I go to, the owner um, does it on his own now. He jumps all the time. And he's like, you should, you should really invest in doing this. It's the funnest thing ever. So he shares videos and they like do flips out the plane and... Sir, and I'm just like, that seems so cool. I would love it. But it's so expensive, too, so I don't have the money right now. <laughs> it is. Well, we just need to get maybe some manufacturing million followers, and then yes. you'll, be able, to, you'll yes. be able to fund it. No problem. <laughs> record, a, record a podcast from up in the plane, and then it's a write-off. That'd be cool. That's a great idea. There you go. Let's do um, it. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm curious. You are talking earlier. I meant to ask this question. You're talking about your son who loves to break things and put them back back together what's the most expensive things he's broken that hasn't been able to put back together um that's a really good question uh he's it's not expensive but you can't put it back together really he loves the sound of glass shattering so we've been able to keep him away from like the hummels and stuff but every once in a while, he would grab, like, a glass we drank out of, and he would just sh- throw it on the floor. Um, and he'd look at you like, wasn't that the coolest sound ever? <laughs> and it's like, that's very cool. Please step away from the mess. I don't want you to cut yourself. So he, uh, yeah. So um, so he's he's turning four this month, and then I have a five-year-old, and then my daughter's 19. She's in college. But um Declan and Ronan are their names. And there was a meme going around Facebook where I have two sons where one is going to actually design the parachute when you jump out of the plane. And I mean this in the most polite way. The other one's going to test that parachute. And that's exactly who my sons are. Um, My son Declan is very, let's let me project manage this and figure it out. And then Ronan is the tester and doesn't care. He'll just do whatever he no questions asked. <laughs> so where did their, I'd imagine with, with you as their mom, there's a lot of unintentional influence into building their, their love of STEM and curiosity and things like that. But what, what do you think has brought that about in them and what can, 
parents do if they see the importance of exposing their kids to things like this and to get them interested in these things early. So I learned this recently with my boys. Um, when I was a, a mom with my daughter, it was different. Um, and girls and boys are different from each other. And I didn't realize it until I had my sons either. So when my daughter was younger, she liked to sit still. She could focus on reading a book. She liked to line blocks up and have things organized. Um, she could sit down at the dinner without me dinner table without me yelling at her or reminding her 40 million times to eat her veggies. Like she sat still and had hyper focus on things. My boys on the other hand, and I don't know if it's because they're two of them and they're so close Mm -hmm. in age. um, They're kind of psychotic and just everywhere and can't sit still. Um, But I do notice that with kids, there's a natural curiosity about everything. They want to learn how things work and they want to know the why of, well, why can't I do that? Or why would I get hurt? Or why would I get burned if I touch a hot stove? Like they're always constantly asking why, which is generally what engineers Hmm. do. They ask why all the time. Um, When I had my daughter, because I was a first time parent, I was young, I freaked out about everything. So I kind of yelled at her to stay away from things. And I think socially here, We tend to do that more with girls. We tend to like coddle them a little Mm. bit and want to keep them safe. Where boys were like, oh, they're just being boys. Let them jump off this and figure it out. Or so we let them kind of get hurt over girls, which is weird because I never thought I would do that. And Mm -hmm. I I learned this over the last four years. I've been doing that because I I was trying to protect my daughter from more things. And now I'm just like, okay, figure it out. It could be a first time parent thing too. I've got, I've got two myself. Alice is is seven and Toby's almost five. And especially with Alice, like when she was from the day she was born until she was probably almost four or five, I felt like I was living in a constant sphere of her imminent death. Yes. (laughs) All the time. And then, Toby, it's like, please don't jump off the tenth stair. Like maybe, maybe the fourth or the fifth. Yeah. Know? But it's like, you kind of. I think after the first one, you're kind of like, okay, they. So long as they're not going to die, allow them to be safely dangerous. Yes, I that agree with sense. that. So, and I think that's what we need to do. So, engineering and manufacturing is all about figuring solutions out to problems and kids are trying to do that they're trying to learn and they're so curious about it and I think some parents have a set idea on what they want their kids to be like my mom she wanted us to be a certain way I love her to death she was just trying because I'm the youngest of six so she she wanted all of us to be successful and be independent because she was a stay-at-home mom And she's like, I don't want you to be a stay at home mom. I want you to have the choice and the option. So she wanted us to be really successful. Um, I think if you set up boundaries too early in a kid's life, um, it kind of sets them up for failure in a way, Mm. not completely, but in a way Um, you want to you want them to be able to know what their passion is. So with my daughter, when she was getting ready to go to college, I tried to encourage her to take a year off Mm -hmm. and travel the world. I was like, how do you know what you like when you've been here your entire time? Like, you don't even know what's outside of our state. Mm -hmm. You haven't been anywhere outside of our state. You haven't even been outside of the country. So how do you know this is what you really want to do? And she's like, I just really want to help people. And I love Grey's Anatomy. So I want to be a surgical nurse. And I said, okay, we'll try it out. If it doesn't work, that's okay. You can always figure something else out. I just talked to a guy on LinkedIn. His wife changed her mind at 50 years old, Hmm. pursued something else, and now she's rocking out as a leader at 52 years old. So I don't think there's a set time on when you decide what you want the rest of your life to look like. I think Mm -hmm. you can change your mind whenever. Yeah, it might mess up your retirement, whatever, but I'm all about being happy and enjoying life and not so much focused on how much money I'm making at the end of the day, and I think that helps a little bit. But with kids especially, I think they need time to figure out what do I love and what makes me happy. And it's okay if it's not at 18 or 17 years old. Mm-hmm. Like, it's okay. They're not going to fail if they don't have their whole entire life figured out. It feels like there's a 
a bit of a disconnect between corporations, schools, and parents in how to best expose kids of all ages to all of the different things. What, what can companies do? And I guess we're speaking specifically about manufacturing and engineering and technology. Mm -hmm. But what can they do to all work together to expose as many kids to as many different possibilities as possible? They need to start having conversations together because it's going to be different for each community, I think, because um, there's communities that have specific manufacturing or engineering for certain types of products. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it just depends on what your community is, where it's located at, what your budget is, like what what do you have for funding? Um, but I do know most states have the MEPs. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these nonprofit organizations that are trying to do the work, um, it seems they're siloed from everything else. So we really need to just come together. Uh, manufacturing Day is coming up in October. Um, I highly suggest communities start thinking, what can we do to really open up the community to our manufacturers? Because again, if you're not focused on the success of your manufacturing companies, your entire community is at risk economically. And I've come from a community like that. Um, we had two manufacturers shut down in the late 90s, and it was devastating. Um, we recently, well, not recently, it's been like over the last five to 10 years, uh, uh, we have a woman who came in, invested a lot of her time and money, and now she's building Beloit back up. And it's an amazing place to go and be and hang out. We have a, um, I don't know what level it is, but they're affiliated with the Oakland A's. So we have a minor league, team. minor league. Yeah. Minor mm -hmm. league. I'm not a sports fan. If you can tell, um, minor league team and, uh, they built a new stadium to bring in more people. Uh, we have a lot of cool new restaurants. Our downtown is set up really nice and we're bringing in more manufacturers, which is really cool. So, uh, we're now having more people wanting to live in Beloit, where before we got made fun of for being one of the dangerous cities in Wisconsin, which was weird. But um, we just we need to work together and find creative ways to do that. One for sure thing is opening up your facility for tours. Mm -hmm. um, I know I still to this day get excited when I go into a manufacturing company and see how they do things and meet the people that are working there. And if they have interns there or apprentices there i like talking to them because it's like okay well what do you like working here for and do you plan on getting a job here when you're done mm -hmm. like i like hearing those stories because it just pays homage to how good that company is with their employees like you said kids are so so curious that why aren't manufacturers once a year sponsoring events to bring young kids i mean if they can get the safety figured out yeah. To bring, of course, the safety of bringing 30 first graders into a manufacturing facility. But if they could figure out how to do that, and these kids are seeing this stuff once a year, any factory is going to be one of the coolest things they've ever seen. Oh, for sure. Well, and even if you, if you can't bring them into the factory because of safety reasons, okay, what do you have going on in your factory that you can scale down and bring to them? Mm -hmm. Like, how can you do that? Um, is there a way to maybe sponsor them to go to a local trade show? Um, I actually got a bus sponsored for IMTS in 2022, um, the high school that I graduated from. I went there. I told the students about IMTS. I'm like, would you want to go there and attend if I can get you there? Every single kid said, yeah. Whether that's because they were really interested or just wanted a day off of school, I don't know, but I got them there. They had a blast, and now I'm trying to extend it for 2024 so they can stay the night and actually spend a full day wow. there. Um, that's what I'm doing for 2024 because they loved it and they want to go back. So if there's a way to get them at trade shows, that's another way for them to get exposed at a higher level too because then it's not just what's going on in their own community. It's actually what's going on around the world they can speak to international companies. They can learn about, you know, what companies are doing in China or India or, you know, anywhere in Europe. Like, they can learn about those opportunities. Um, so, yeah, I think you just have to be creative. 
Um, I went to Automation Fair last year, and I have to connect with one of my uh, I, Tim Wilborn. I don't know if you know him. He knows the guy's name that I'm trying to figure out right now. Um, but they actually had a roller coaster demo at Automation Fair, and I'm like. This is the coolest thing ever. How do we get this in schools? Mm -hmm. I want to take that. If I have to pay for it, fine. Um, But I want to take that and bring it to the high school I graduated from just to see what reaction I can get. Because it's all PLC stuff. They program it to do the loops. Um, If there's something wrong with the track, it's supposed to send a notification for preventative maintenance if like a wheel is off or something, it's supposed to send that information. So it's really showing like how to construct it, program it, and do preventative maintenance on it. So why not bring something like that to schools? Yeah, and even looking at it from a cynical side, the the goodwill in advertising that something like that would create to send a <laughs> roller coaster on a multi-state school-wide tour and the exposure that would have, those kids would remember that company name for their entire lives. Yeah. Well, and I saw that Balif was doing a mobile trade show. So why not connect? And I don't know if I haven't done enough research on it, but I'm hoping that what they're doing is actually stopping by schools with that as well, too. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the manufacturing organization here? There's so many acronyms I get them mixed up, but there is a manufacturing association here in Illinois, but they have a, an escape room on a trailer and they've been bringing it to trade shows. So one of the things is if you want to get out of the trailer, you have to know all this engineering and manufacturing hmm. information. So why not bring that to schools? Yeah, there's a price tag to it, but how can we get that funded so you can bring it to schools and have kids have fun with it? Because those were popular for quite some time those escape rooms and again it's the it's the long term view and it's it's hard because the people that are setting this up now setting these young young generations that don't even have a name yet up for success we're going to be long gone we're going to be dirt yeah <laughs> when these kids are making a difference in this community but you have to take that long term view that we're responsible for for the future of of this industry for the future of manufacturing in the yeah. United States and if if we don't care because it's costing money then we're being we're being incredibly irresponsible. Yeah. Well, I had a conversation with um her name is Allison Giddens. She uh is one of the owners of Wintech in uh Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. And um she was doing an online like summer internship that was really successful during the pandemic and uh it was really cool to see and hear what the kids were coming up with but one of the points she made i thought was really um big that companies should consider they always at the beginning of the year or towards the end of the previous year they always come together and they do their strategic planning where they have to budget out certain money to go to certain places, whether Mm -hmm. that's marketing money, sales money, trade shows, dinners, whatever, they have a budget and they're allocating it out to certain places to help with the success of the company. Why not allocate some of that budget, not just for marketing, but for community outreach programs so that, okay, we're gonna dedicate this amount to go to either this first robotics team or we're gonna pay these three engineers to go spend an hour or two hours of their time at this school to teach them what we're actually doing here in our company, which I think would be a really cool idea um, that I've had a conversation with several people about, like, actually let your engineers go for a day because they work 70 hours a day, 70 hours a week. Let them go for a day, take a break and teach these kids what you're actually doing in your manufacturing company. Well, you need to find those engineers that can talk to people. Like you said, yeah. you're having a challenge finding <laughs> Have them come to me first, and I'll get them talking. <laughs> um, so any last thoughts or ideas on how companies can set themselves apart from the competition and how they can really have the best shot of landing all of the best and brightest minds out there. It's hard to say something that will set them apart from the competition because I think right now what we need is to collaborate with one another. I think Hmm. we need to pull together and figure out ways to get the next generation really excited. Um, I keep looking at things that I've attended. So like 
first robotic competitions are amazing because those kids are darn proud of the work that they put in, especially if they get the right mentors. Um, kids just want someone to believe in them and give them hope for a better future. Like there's a lot of kids out there that have trauma in their life, which I couldn't even imagine at that age, but it it is, it's a thing. Um, and they're really looking for inspiration and hope that they don't have to repeat patterns that they grew up with. And that's why I collaborate with Andrew Crow so much because he gives that hope to kids. He has a story. His story is phenomenal. Um, he connects with kids on that level. And I've seen him make teenage boys cry because they were just like, wow, I thought my life was gone and you gave me hope that I can actually make something of myself and do something that I can be proud in. So I like linking up with people and not considering them as competition. Um, but I think what will make you gain a step ahead of other companies is if you actually are more proactive and instead of talking about it till you turn everybody's blue, everybody's face blue, um, actually be about it and go to the school, talk to the kids, ask what they're interested in, show that you want to hang out with them and they'll remember you forever. Mm -hmm. They'll remember. And even if it's not the entire class, if you can get one person, right, it's that 1%. If you can get one person to kind of perk up and come join our sector, that's better than what we were doing yesterday. So I think if you really want to step ahead of your competition, you need to be that brand that kids are going to remember. So when they do graduate, and they want to work in engineering or manufacturing, they're going to say, I want to work for that company because they came here and they they gave a, a damn about me. Mm-hmm. So, Well, you do such a great job of that. You know, you're part of that collective, lovingly known as you know, manufacturing mafia. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you and Chris Lukey and Jay Collin and Andrew Crow and who am I forgetting? But, Mike Sully. <laughs> Mike Sully. <laughs> Mike Sully Sullivan. Um But, I mean, not that you're all competition, but you all work for different companies in manufacturing, and and some of them are working for direct competitors, but all collaborating together, advocating for the industry, spreading the message, spreading the word that this is a tremendous industry that people can thrive in, they can be creative in, they can they can change the world through the work that they're doing, and I think it's it's really a powerful message that you can be, for lack of a better word, well, working at competing companies but still advocating for the collective good of the industry. Yeah, because that's the other thing too. Part of your story is your own unique characteristics of yourself, and you're not going to get along with everyone, but. Just because you don't get along with everyone doesn't mean someone else won't. So I'm always like, if I can't help someone and I know someone else that can, I want to be able to have that person be successful still. So I'm very like transparent about, hey, I don't really have that skill set. I can't help you, but I know so and so. So let me connect you two. And it's just if you put good karma out in the universe, it definitely comes back to you. So I'm not trying to get bad karma to turn around and slap me in the face. So I try to be, uh, put as much good energy out there as possible because it does come around. And Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen everybody in our group who's done that. Um, they've just been growing and growing and growing. So it's gotta have something to do with it. Right. I'm sure it does. (laughs) Uh, Megan, thank you so much for being here today. Is there, uh, what's the best way for people to find you, get a hold of you, um, reach out to you about anything that you might be able to help them with or they might be able to help you with. Yeah, so if you go to mavensofmanufacturing.com, I have a link at the bottom of my homepage that says schedule time with me. So that's the easiest way to schedule or book an appointment with me. Otherwise, just go on LinkedIn. Um, Send me a message, connect with me there. I try to get back to people within 24 hours, but I've learned that LinkedIn messaging can get really out of hand. Um, so the easiest way would just to, to book time with me going to mavensofmanufacturing.com. Megan Ziemba, it has been a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, thank you to our producer, Noah Cuff. This has been Hired the Podcast. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you.